Tell your grandma about this when we get off. Has anybody here ever been to Selma, Alabama? Somebody? I've drove past it. Well, we're at, that's close enough. Yeah. So you get an idea of what, what it's like down there. You can you kind of picture that in kind of stack you know, Kind of rolling fields, a lot of pasture land, and that kind of thing. Selma is in the southern part of Alabama. What we used to call the deep south, as distinguished from the upper south. Up here around Springdale and Fayetteville, we're considered upper south. And that's an important distinction in the deep south. Uh, that's where in the old days uh, we had plantations. You've either seen Gone with the Wind or you've heard about Gone with the Wind. The, the deep south is gone with the wind down the south. Okay, here where we live, it's, it's all together different. Selma is in the deep south. And that's an important thing to know. In 1965, something was going on in the United States that was new. It never happened before with such urgency. What was happening was that a great effort was being made for the first time to open up the election process to all citizens, not just white citizens. And that was a big thing. By tradition and by custom and by law, uh, millions of black Southerners were not allowed to vote. Now, there were exceptions in places like Northwest Arkansas, in my hometown, Hot Springs, Arkansas, and that had never applied there. But in the Deep South, places like Selma, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, it was the custom going back to, well, forever, going back to the days of slavery. Uh, black citizens were not allowed to vote. That was what was going on in Selma, Alabama in the winter of 1965. A group of uh, very smart and very angry young black people had come to Selma to try to change that old custom. <coughs> they had come down there to challenge the old way of doing things. These were people in an organization that was known as the is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And grab a hold of that word, nonviolent. Non-violent. That's going to that's going to be an important part of what I have to tell you here today. Because a new way of dealing with uh, with politics was being born, and it was it was based on what became known as the nonviolence movement. Now, now think about uh, countries you've heard about in the news, uh, now, say in the Middle East, where people who are dissatisfied with, with their politics, with their establishment, governments, with their whatever, uh, they're trying to change things. And how are they doing it? They're doing it by cutting off people's heads. They're doing it by taking their uh, AK rifles and, their, and bombs, and they're trying to change it using violence. What, what was happening in the United States in 1965 was, yes? Um, what they were doing in 1965 is that, um, I read about it, is that some firefighters, they would grab their fire trucks and they would spray blacks down with water and try and drown. That's exactly right. That happened. In fact, that happened just a few miles up the road from Selma in the city of Birmingham. It did, and it was a terrible thing to, to happen. And they, they had these high-powered fire hoses. Uh, and, and the firemen could turn that great pressure, water with great pressure, on these kids. Uh, people your age, and, and, and you can imagine what would happen. Well, you've seen it. You've seen pictures of it, I suppose. Yeah. You, you get hit with that water at that pressure and you get to throw you right across the yard. I mean, it hurts you. And that was one of many, many uh, 
uh, tactics that uh, that the uh, authorities were using to keep down black people, keep them in their place, as it was said in those days. Yeah, that was one of the things. You're, you're exactly right. Uh, things like that were happening itself. And, and these efforts on the, on the part of the sheriff and the uh, authorities were all to keep black people from voting. Voting. That was, what, that was the big issue. That was the, that was the great cause. Uh, the leaders of the black community have figured out that uh, before they could make any other real gains, before they could get any other rights at all, they had to get the right to vote. Because as long as, as the same old crowd was being elected year after year after year, and that same old crowd was always uh, usually old white men, old men my age. Uh, you don't think I'm old, do you? No. Yes. <laughs> anyway, they, they were challenging this old custom. And it, it had to be changed through the ballot box, through voting. And that's what the, the campaign itself was all about. And eventually Martin Luther King came in. Uh, and, and, and became the, the very famous leader of the movement. I remember, I want to tell you about a particular afternoon in Selma, Alabama, March 7th, 1965, which became known as Bloody Sunday. Have any of you seen the movie Selma? Yeah. Well, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. You saw what happened in that movie. And although it is a movie and some of it is made up, you know, that's okay there. But the part that they showed in the movie that had the, uh, the marchers being hit with clubs, and, well, let me tell you what happened. Because they got it right in the movie. That was exactly the way it was. I was there as a reporter for the New York Times. I was one of maybe two or three dozen reporters who had come in uh, to cover the, the movement in Selma, which was building up, building up, building up, getting more and more attention. On Sunday afternoon, after church had let out, the people who were uh, taking part in the march that was scheduled for that afternoon had gathered in a church of Brown's Chapel over in the black neighborhood. They gathered there and lined themselves up in, in a marching column, uh, two people abreast, marching <coughs> side to side. The Alabama River runs through Selma. They marched uh, up to the river and the, the bridge crossing the river, and that bridge is still there for the same name. It's called the Edmund Pettus Bridge, P-E-T-T-U-S, the Pettus Bridge. I was waiting on the other side of the bridge when they, when they arrived, because we had, a, we had an inkling of what was going to happen. But here's what happened. First of all, the police the state police were in charge, not the city police. The state police were in charge. They had put us off in a kind of corral off to one side, over on the shoulders of the road, where we were kind of out of their way. And looking back on it, that was fine with me, because that probably saved my head from getting busted over. <coughs> they, uh, the state troopers were lined up all across the road completely blocking the highway. There must have been 50 or 60 of them, all in uniforms and their, their hard hat helmet, helmets. And when the marchers came down uh, facing them and had to stop, and by the way, Martin Luther King was not there that day. Some of you might have the, the impression that he was there. He was not. He was off in another part of the United States making a speech. And it's important that he was not there that day because his life might have been shortened considerably. 
if he had been there that day. But some of his uh, workers were there, some of his lieutenants, uh, the chairman of the student nonviolent committee was there. His name is John Lewis. Does anybody here recognize the name John Lewis? I said Congressman John Lewis. Did that ring a bell? Yeah. You know what? Yeah, he's, he's still in Congress. He got elected to the House of Representatives years later, and he's still there. Uh, I got to know him and admire him a great deal. He was one of the casualties on this day I'm about to tell you about. The marchers stopped and were dead still and quiet. And the head of the state troopers stepped forward and said something like, this march will not proceed. This is an illegal march. Uh, I will give you two minutes to disperse and go back to your church. Excuse me a minute. He gave him two minutes, but in less than one minute, the head of the state police put on his uh, gas mask and gave the order to charge. Now, all with the state troopers, there was a group of uh, uh, men on horses who worked for the sheriff of the county. The sheriff's name was James Clark. Some of you might have read about Sheriff Jim Clark. He's one of the villains in this story. These men on horseback also put on their gas masks. The troopers went flying forward in, a, in what was known back in those days as a flying wedge. The leaders were out in, in the narrow wedge and uh, troopers spread out behind them in, in, in the shape of a wedge. And the wedge just ran forward, ran right over the crowd marching. Uh, and when they did, they, they were flailing with their billy clubs. Uh, the, the men on horseback had horse whips. Any of you own a horse whip? You don't want to talk about I mean, you, can you imagine being, having somebody on a horse, you know, reaching over and, and repeatedly whipping you on your back or your face, your face? Yeah, your eyes. So that's what was going on. And in, in the next minute, two minutes, three minutes, the, the march had completely disintegrated in the chaos. Uh, several people were knocked unconscious. Somebody uh, threw a tear gas bomb. I'm not even going to ask whether anybody here has ever experienced tear gas. I'm going on the assumption that you have not. I pray that you have not. Uh, I have a little experience with it, and I can tell you that it's not something that you want to find yourself in the middle of. It, uh, it cuts off your, it cuts your breath off. Please, you can't breathe, and yet you have to breathe. You you must breathe. If you can't breathe. Your thinking is, I'm going to die. Uh, your eyes go blind. Uh, you can't see. Your tears running down out of your eyes. <coughs> well, that's that's uh, we in the press got the tear gas. And so we were over there wiping our eyes and coughing and trying to. Um, and it took several minutes to be able to, to see what was, you know, to get a clear view and to go back to work. The uh, one, of, one of the many heroes of that day, aside from the marchers themselves, was a, uh, a television cameraman who did not have a gas mask but who just waded in to the tear gas and the melee with his camera running. And he caught all of that brutality on 
camera. And that night, one of the main programs on television, the most popular, was interrupted to bring a special report on what had happened in South Alabama that afternoon. And, and, so, and suddenly, millions of Americans who didn't know anything about this were just stunned to see, uh, say, live, as it was recorded, of what had happened at Pettus Bridge that afternoon. People stumbling, people knocked unconscious. John Lewis was knocked unconscious, and, and his skull was cracked. Yeah. An old lady named Amelia Boynton was knocked unconscious and was left lying on the grass in the middle of it. Uh, I think over a hundred people were injured. Uh, a bunch of them had to go to the hospital emergency room. It was easily the most brutal thing that I had ever had to witness as a reporter. And I hope that I never have to see it again. So that was bloody Sunday. There's a lot more to it, and I can go on all day about the bloody Sunday. But I think those of you who have seen the movie, uh, I, I can tell you that part of the movie dealing with what happened there at the bridge that day, you can rely on that to be the truth. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazing piece of reporting in itself. And incidentally, I think that movie is important because it's a way of reminding us of what our country used to be. And thank goodness we've gone a long way past that. We will never have another bloody Sunday. Of course, there are all kinds of other issues still alive to be dealt with, but we won't have bloody Sunday again. And for that, we can be grateful. Does anybody have a question before I go on? Anybody? People ask me now and then if I ever felt threatened as a reporter covering the civil rights movement. And, uh, uh, yeah, sure, but not, not seriously, I don't think. Uh, reporters were killed, uh, reporters were killed, for example, in 1962 at the University of Mississippi. Two or three people were killed, including a journalist who was there just doing his job. But uh, by and large, reporters we're pretty lucky. But, uh, okay. yeah. um, so, on that Sunday, whenever like, um, all that fighting stuff happened, it was called Bloody Sunday? I'm okay. sorry. Great, you give me some help. Yeah, what's your question? On um, that Sunday, where everybody was fighting and stuff, is it called Bloody Sunday? Yes. Mm -hmm. he, he was just making sure that uh, that day was called Bloody Sunday. Yes. yes. Yeah. And for good reason, you see. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Other questions. I know I know we've got a lot of questions here. Don't be shy. Yeah, I'm, really, gonna, gonna ask I'm here them. to answer questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe? Yeah. yeah. What did your parents think about, like, what did your family think about you whenever you were there? My mother was terrified. <laughs> mothers, you all have mothers. Can you imagine what your mother would think if you were out there? Yeah, and, uh, yeah she, that. she did not want me to be there, bless her heart. But what, that's a strange thing about being in a dangerous situation like that. It's never as bad when you're in the middle of it as it looks from the outside looking in. I can understand why my mother was worried about me. Because she was watching the television and reading my paper and the other. And she would she read, she read about the danger and your imagination takes hold and you think, oh, this is awful. And it is it's bad, but when you're in the middle of it as a reporter or a photographer, it's never as bad as, as it looks from, from the outside. Yeah. Is John Lust still alive? My mother? Yeah. No, John Lust. He is. He's still in Congress. He's in the House of Representatives. I saw him on television just the other day. Uh, can I tell if he was still alive or not? Yeah. yeah, he's very much alive. He's a great man. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, good question. You all hear what motivated me to get interested in civil rights to I'll tell you. I was working for the Arkansas Gazette in Little Rock in 1957. You all know what happened in Little Rock in 1957, yes. right? Yes. Central yeah. High School. <laughs> this fellow right here, my grandson, Benson, would you stand up so they can see you? This is my grandson, Benson Reed. He's a graduate of Central High School. He and his brother both graduated from Central High School. Uh, and and I, I'm great, I, I assume they've read about Central High. Do they know about Central High? Some of them may be studying that right now. Okay. So it, I, in answer to the question about what motivated me, I was there at the Gazette in 1957 when Central High School was integrated racially integrated. It had been an all-white high school all of its history. And in the fall of 1957, it was to be racially integrated. Nine black kids from various all-black schools around the city were enrolled in Central High School. There rose up in the rock a white resistance from what we're known then as segregationists. You all know them. I'm sure you've heard that word, segregationist. Mm -hmm. uh, back then and still, it meant uh, that you believe that the races need to be segregated in everything, in, in all public ways. Schools, churches, restaurants, restrooms. Uh, and it was the law in many of the southern states. Uh, so this, in 1957, was the first attempt to break down the old law and custom of segregation in the schools of Little Rock, Arkansas. It became world famous because the governor at that time, Orville Faubus, uh, called out the National Guard and prevented the integration of Central High School. Uh, and over the next year or two or three, all that squabble played out in the courts. They finally succeeded <coughs> in integrating Central High School. By the time Benson went there, what year did you start in Central High? Uh, 2004. What? 2004. 2004. It had been integrated forever by then. And it's now probably the most integrated school in Arkansas. Back then, it was a big, big news story. I happened to be in Little Rock. Not covering that, but he said, I was a new guy on the paper. But I saw it up close and realized this is happening all over the South. And as a reporter, I decided I wanted to be part of covering that. Because this was a big story in our time, not just in the South, but all over the United States. So eventually I left the Gazette and worked for the New York Times. And for a long time after I went, Worth of time. I went to work first in the Atlanta, Georgia here, and I covered civil rights there almost entirely. After I moved to Washington, I covered the White House for a while, but then I shifted back over to cover civil rights from the nation's capital. But you can see if, you, if you're a reporter, your inclination is to be in the thick of things. You want to be where the big story is. So that was my whole question. Thank you for that question. Anybody else? I, I should explain that uh, the civil rights movement extended far beyond Selma, Alabama. Uh, there were big civil rights stories in, in Birmingham, as this young man was aware of. Uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, right across the South, there were eruptions of conflict over the race issue. One of the most interesting places to me, a place that I'm betting nobody in this room has ever been to. Prove me wrong. Has anybody here ever been in Bogalusa, Louisiana? Not a one. Well, I'm not surprised. Any of you been in New Orleans? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people have been in New Orleans. We all know about New Orleans. 
Tongaloosa is about 50 miles out of New Orleans, across Lake Pontchartrain, up in the north. It was a paper mill town. And the civil rights movement came to Bogalusa. And along with the civil rights movement came Roy Reed from the New York Times and all of the other national reporters. And we swept in there and, and covered the rivers there. Uh, and that was an aspect of it that was different from Selma. First of all, the town was far different from Selma. The only thing that had in common with Selma was the depth of the racial prejudice against black people. But there was a vital difference. In Alabama, the governor was a man, the governor was a man named George C. Wallace, who, who built his entire political career on segregation. In fact, one of his famous speeches had the line, segregation now, segregation forever. Uh, in, that, in Louisiana, the governor of the state was Earl Long. You all have heard of Huey Long in, in the reading of history. Does that mean right now, Huey Long? He had a younger brother named Earl Long. They were both governors at their at different times. Earl Long was the governor when the civil rights movement came to Bogalusa. Earl Long was the polar opposite of George C. Wallace. Earl Long was an integrationist, which was almost unheard of in that part of the South. He, uh, he went out of his way to improve the lives of black citizens, including opening up the polls about them. He, uh, And he defied the, uh, the segregationists in the state of Louisiana uh, and fought them and, and beat them. And he, he, brought, he made integration happen in Louisiana. There's a lot more to this man. And he, he, a famous movie was made about him many years ago. I, I can't really recommend it to you. It involved a, a street stripper, and I, the parents would jump all over me if they wanted But actually, it's about Earl Long, which is, he, he was a great human being. Uh, anyway, he made, Bogal he made sure that Bogalusa ended differently from the story of Selma, Alabama. <coughs> Incidentally, the story, the Bogalusa story, which went on for months, I was in and out of Bogalusa over and over. There would be some violence. Uh, one night, a black deputy sheriff was shot to death. And there was a big uh, alibi over that, and I went back to cover that. Uh, there was always something going on. Uh, famous rabble rouser named J.B. Stoner came to town uh, and held a rally out on the outskirts of town. And I heard language there that I never, had never heard before. I was raised in a small town of Arkansas. I certainly was acquainted with the language of white supremacy, raw racism. I never heard anything as bad as I heard from that man very really soon that night. Attention teachers and students, all testing is now complete, so you may return back to your regular schedule. Also, I need the following students to report to the front office. Donovan Mesa, Lindsay Terwilger, Rosa Dennis, Jacqueline Cervantes, Rebecca Robbins, Arnold Grace, Courtney Thompson, Dylan Morhans, and Albert Vera. Once again, these following students, please report to the office. Thank you. I keep you all at the test. <laughs> I would want to drive you the test. Um, anyway, Bob Lucy. 
in the middle of the story. I was over there covering whatever the story happened to be. When uh, I got word that a hurricane was about to hit the south coast of Louisiana. And so I had to drop everything and, uh, and just huddle down. It was too late to catch a plane back to uh, Atlanta. It was too dangerous. So uh, another reporter who was a friend of mine, he and I uh, were staying in a very nice hotel in the French Quarter, Louisiana. So we just hunkered down there and, uh, until the hurricane passed. Um, and frankly, the hurricane was a great relief because it was as bad as it was, it was less depressing to my spirit than what I had had to listen to in the Bogalusa story day after day. Less depressing, if you can imagine. By the way, a bunch of people were killed in that hurricane. Uh, it was a dreadful thing. Can, can I <coughs> so was the hurricane that you experienced um, um, something similar to Hurricane. Ray, would you Katrina? help me? Yeah. Sorry, I can't. Was the hurricane he experienced um, some, somewhat similar to Hurricane Katrina? Was it similar to Katrina? Is maybe the same location? It was the same location, but an earlier hurricane. It was called Betsy. Hurricane Betsy, 1965. Yeah. Um, actually, I have two questions. Um, one was, have you ever reported on Martin Luther King, Jr.? Yes, let me answer that one first. Yes, um, I knew Martin Luther King. I mean, he and I were like close friends, not that kind of knowing, but I knew him. I dealt with him all the time, interviewed him a lot. Uh, and I thought very highly of him. He, he became a hero of mine. In fact, uh, in a minute, I want to read you something in regard to Martin Luther King. You got a second question? Oh, I forgot. That's okay. <laughs> this young lady right here in the front. Did you have a question? I'm sorry. Well, while we're, while we're off of the hurricane, let me, uh, let me read you something about Martin Luther King. Attention students, I need Albert Vera to the office. Albert Vera to the office, please. Jackson and Dr. King preached the funeral sermon for Jimmy Lee Jackson a few days later. <clears throat> and back in those days, we didn't have tape recorders. Recorders didn't. Well, they were available, but they were not found this table. And you couldn't, you know, you couldn't even do anything with them. So what we did, and like at this uh, funeral sermon, Three or four or five of us reporters got together immediately after the sermon was over outside. And we compared our notes on what he had said to try to get it as exact as we could in his own words. And that was what we had to do. We didn't have reliable tape recording. So these are his actual words as best as they could be put together by four or five of us reporters on the scene after he told me. And here's what he had to say you know, on what had killed Jimmy Lee Jackson. He was murdered 
by the indifference of every white minister of the gospel who has remained silent behind the safe security of his stained glass windows. He was murdered by the irresponsibility of every politician from governor's own town who has fed his constituents the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. He was murdered by the timidity of a federal government that is willing to spend millions of dollars a day to defend freedom in Vietnam, but cannot protect the rights of its citizens at home. He was murdered by the brutality of every sheriff who practices lawlessness in the name of the law. And he was murdered by the cowardice of every Negro who passively accepts the evils of segregation and stands on the sidelines in the struggle for justice. I, I can't tell you how those words affected me at the time and still do. I can still hear his voice. I can call him up just by punching a button. He was, by all of us, the greatest public speaker that I ever encountered. And I, I've covered presidents, I've covered great academics, I've covered governors, senators, uh, but nobody was ever the match of Mark Luther King. You ask if I knew Mark Luther King. I knew him in that way as a public figure. You know, I would interview him now and then. Uh, and not always interviews, he was, he was just fun to be around. He was funny. He had a good sense of humor. He could relax. Uh, but out in public, he was always very much aware, aware of who he was and of his responsibility. He knew what he had become. He had become the public face of the resistance to this terrible evil. And he knew that he had to carry on and be responsible. Oh, yeah, I don't remember Marlowe. Did you ever cover Malcolm X? Never did. No. Never, I don't think I was ever in the same room, but no, I, I didn't really know him. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. What advice would you give people today about fighting for justice? What? About what? About fighting for justice. For justice. Oh, good question. Good question. Well, let me ask you a question. What's what's the uh, big issue in the country right now regarding the struggle for justice? What's your guess? What's the number one thing on people's minds? Well, some people are on one side and other people are on the other side. You think of gay rights, maybe? That's one of them, yeah. Uh, I guess if you, first of all, you have to learn to care about this or that issue. And you learn to care by keeping up with what's going on in the country and in the world. And I can't tell you how important that is. Uh, make yourself aware of current events. I, I know your teachers talk to you about that, and you need to pay attention. But on your own, at home, uh, you all have laptops and this and that and the other. I got a Kindle recently, and I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> uh, and so it's easy to keep up with, 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 with public affairs, and I urge you to do that. Read the newspaper. There's still newspapers. Around. That man back yonder works for a newspaper. Yeah. John, tell them, tell them that they, they, you have to read the newspaper. You have to know what's going on. And that's how you learn to care. And that's what leads you to becoming involved in the struggle for justice. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you feel about the recent events in Ferguson, Missouri? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. How do you feel about the recent events in Ferguson? In Ferguson, Missouri. Oh, boy. Yeah. There is. There he is, uh, an example of a many layered issue. Uh, we know right off the bat that uh, Michael, oh, sorry, oh, Michael, Michael, Brown. Michael Brown was not armed, that he was 
shot to death by a white police officer. Now since then, we've had maybe half a dozen examples of the same kind of thing happen all over the country. And it's never entirely clear uh, that justice is all on one side or all on the other. For example, in Ferguson, we found out uh, afterward that Michael Brown had, uh, right, he had shoplifted something out of the store. And, and he was, when he was approached in the car, he apparently attacked the police officer. And the police officer started by killing him. Probably an overreaction. That's still being investigated. So as an old reporter, my instinct is to stand back and wait for the final investigation and see uh, and hope that we get even more facts, not, not surmise, not speculation, and not let our personal prejudice get in the way. We've had a more recent example over in, I believe, Tulsa, just two or three nights ago, where an old deputy sheriff uh, shot to death a black man, apparently accidentally. He thought he was going to use his taser on this guy. And instead of his taser, he pulled out his pistol and pulled the trigger. And then he immediately said, no, I didn't kill him. I'm sorry, I shot him. Uh, just a terrible mistake. Well, he'll be taken to court and probably convicted of manslaughter or something. In that case, no, you can't get not anywhere near a clear cut that he was acting out of racism. Uh, you know, he didn't mean to do it. He was, he was trying to get his taser gun. And there have been examples all over the country, some of them clear cut, like in North Charleston, South Carolina, where that police officer deliberately shot that man eight times as he was running away, had his back turned. And that police officer's been charged with murder, as he should have been. Yeah. But, you know, keep, this is the kind of news that all of us should be paying attention to, because it's not going away. Along with uh, gay rights, racism continues in one form or another in the United States. And you all need to keep up to date on that. You need to read about it. Make up your own mind. Make up your own minds. What, what struggles are worthwhile? I think we have about, uh, what, what we got, right? Ten minutes? Just a couple more minutes. Couple maybe, more minutes. maybe one or two more questions. Just jump back again. Have you ever covered anything on the students? On what? The students. What do you say? Sit-ins. Sit-ins? Sit-ins. Sit-ins. Let me remember. I must have. I must have. Maybe a little long, long time ago. But mostly, I mostly miss the sit-in group, uh, partly because I had not yet gone to work for New York Times. I was still in New York, so the sit-in movement started, as, as I bet you know, in the East. In this, where was it? North Carolina, or Virginia, uh, one of you could probably tell me. And that was a very effective movement. It did come to Little Rock. And uh, the uh, Woolworth store and one of the others were not in trouble because they refused service to black citizens who came in to be served and they got in trouble with that. Uh, did you cover anything on Emmett Till? Oh, Emmett Till. No. Emmett Till was, was killed two or three years before I left Arkansas. And, uh, and uh, I, I was certainly aware of it. You know, that was a big, big story at the time. No, I never did uh, cover anything about it. No. Yeah. Um, do you think Martin Luther King would have acted the same way as um, when he acted when Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed, so like when Michael Brown was killed? Right, give me a read. read. I, th I think what she's asking is the way that. Are, are you asking if, like, what exactly are you asking? I'm not sure. Like, sure either. How would you think, or how would you think if um, Michael? Uh, how, how would how do you think Martin Luther King would respond to 
Brown. Ferguson and Michael Brown shooting um, if, if he were here. Is that, is that your question? He would be right in the middle of it. I tell you. In fact, part of his story is that he moved away from, before he was killed, he moved away from the civil rights movement and became very deeply involved in the anti-war movement, the Vietnam War was going on. And a lot of American soldiers were being killed. A huge number of Vietnamese. And he got himself involved in that. And by doing so, he earned a permanent en enmity of President Lyndon Johnson. Uh, a lot of people thought that Dr. King had made a mistake by becoming involved in that. I happen to think that he had not. If there was a major public issue that was dividing the country, with his standing in the world, he needed to come from. That's another way of saying, yeah, he would have been involved in Berlin and all these other places. Uh, and just wanted to guess what difference it might have made. But unfortunately, we no longer have a person of his stature to lead the way. Yeah. Did you ever cover anything on the Black Panthers? Black Panthers? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. In fact, I was present in a rally in Greenwood, Mississippi, the night that you might say the Black Panther movement was started. Uh, uh, a student leader named Stokely Carmine made a speech, a very fiery speech, uh, at a rally that night in Greenwood, Mississippi. It must have been 1966 sometime. And he, he made a very angry speech, very angry, recounting all the terrible wrongs that were being done every day. He himself had been put in jail about 29 or 30 different times for resisting segregation. Uh, and he was there one more time, inviting the police to arrest him for him. He didn't care about that. And at the end of his speech, he said, he didn't say it's time to go beyond nonviolence. He didn't do that. But he did say it's time for black people to assert themselves with greater force. And what this movement needs is black power. And the audience just rose up as one person shouting, yes, yes. And then Stokely said, what do we need? Black power. It was only much later that I learned that the black power movement did not actually start that night in Greenwood. But a young man named Willie Ricks, uh, my colleague of Stokely Carmichael in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating District, had actually used that term in another little old bidding town somewhere in South Mississippi. There were no reporters there. It never went beyond that town. And he, he, didn't, he made the same essential speech. All we need is black power. And the people there, immediately picked up with what a powerful slogan that was. Word spread around to the other young members of the movement, including Stokely Carmine, he decided to all the press that night in Greenwood. That was the time. It was on television. One footnote, and then I think it was maybe time to let you go. A long time, well, maybe two years after that. I was in Atlanta. There was a riot in Atlanta a race riot, and there was a slack period, nothing going on. One afternoon, I was sitting in my car and uh, in the black neighborhood, and Willie Ricks came walking up, and, and I invited him into the car, and he sat down, and we started just talking, passing the time of day, talking a little bit about what had been going on in the movement. And finally, <coughs> most shocking thing that maybe ever happened to me while I was coming in the room. He turned around in the passenger seat of my car and looked me in the eye and he said, Roy, I have to tell you, 
that when the revolution comes, and it was a matter of faith by the young people then, that there would be a revolution. When the revolution comes, boy, if I ever see you in the sights of my gun, I'll pull the trigger. How would that crash be told that you'd be killed by this? Well, what could I say? <laughs> I don't remember that I said anything. I said, well, okay, but any other questions for him? Okay, one more. Did media help on the racism? Did media help on racism? On racism? Absolutely. The media had a great deal to do with exposing the evil of racism. And probably at the short time that it takes to, uh, to, to move into another realm and get to a better day. Yeah. We have to have a meeting. Print and television and radio. Oh, okay.